So in, in theory of uh, computing, this is like kind of the uh, theoretical side of computing. Um, we can s come up with a formal way of trying to describe what's involved when doing a computation. And in doing that, we have a certain amount of theoretical equipment we could use, which is going to later become like a computer and a processor and memory, to perform a computation, and then um, it gives an answer. And then depending on what your problem, the problem you're trying to solve, we could look, get an idea of how difficult it is to solve the problem, based on how much equipment is needed to solve the problem, and so on. So, a formal way of def defining this would be a language. So, for example, the language English is a language. Let's say English was a function, and you pass in a word in the English language, and this function will tell you either yes or no if it is a word. So, for example, if you passed in dog, it would answer yes because dog is a word in the English language. If you put in X, Y, Z, it would answer no. Right, so what we're basically going to do is define a computation based on languages. And what we'll find hopefully later on, we'll start to realize there's a one-to-one -one correlation between languages and computer problems. Okay, so suppose we decided that we wanted to define a language, and I guess there's infinitely many languages that we can define, but suppose we wanted to define a language, we'll say L1 is equal to all the words that start with an A, oh, let's say all, all the words that have the letters A, B, A, or, a, B, D. That's our entire language. And actually, um, a language is going to be made up of letters. Right? So we're going to have an alphabet. And we can actually make the alphabet a lot simpler. The English language uses the 26 letters. And uh, we could make it simpler by just saying the only letters we use are A and B. So for this particular language, L1, this is no longer English, this is a different language. Um, if you gave it A, B, A, it would answer yes. And if you gave it A, B, B, it would answer yes. And if you gave it anything else, it would answer no. If you said B, A, B, it would answer no. No, that's not a word in this language. Okay. Suppose we had another language, I'll call it L2, and we could use notation like this. We could say A, A, followed by B, and we could have, that plus means we have at least one B, and we may have many Bs, as many as we want actually and then it ends in, let's say, A. So now, for this language, language 2, if somebody asked, is this a member of, of that language, what should it answer? In this case, it should answer yes. yes. Right, because we have an A, an A, and then we have the plus means at least one B, and then there could be many of them, and then Finally, an A. The plus means? Yeah, so the plus means, um, a plus means at least, at least one. And a star will mean zero, uh, uh, I should say, let me do this, I'll say one to infinity. One to infinity. And a star means zero to infinity. So this language is all the languages that have words that start with an A, followed by an A, 
and then at least one B, but could be many Bs, and then ends with an A. So would this word be in the language? Yes. Uh, yes. Well, no, this is saying it has to start with an A. The second letter has to be an A. From third through as far as it needs to go can be a B, but then the last letter must be yes. an A. Oh, it's just one element and that one element has to be in that format. That's like AA and then any number of Bs. And then and it then must be an A. a. One A. Okay. And that must be it. So this would not be in the language because there's no A, a. here. Okay. Now if we had this one, would that be in the language? That one's also no, no because, because it ends in two A's and we have to end in one A. Sure. Okay. So, now the question is, how could we decide, what if we wanted to create, and this is going to really in the end turn out to be a computer program that will take any letter, any string, and then it will always answer yes or no, depending on what the language is. How can we decide, what kind of a computer type thinking apparatus could we create that will answer yes or no. So what we can do is we can say, well, we kind of move, in this case, we are in the state, as we're reading the input, we're in the state where we haven't read an A yet, and we know we have to read an A. Then once we read an A, we kind of go to a state where, okay, we've already read one A, we now expect to read another A. Then we, after we're reading a second A, if we go, we go to a state where we need to read at least one B, but maybe many, many Bs. So as long as we keep reading a B, we just stay in that state, I guess. And then finally, when we read the last A, we move to a final state that says this is now acceptable. And if we see anything else, then it becomes unacceptable. So it might look like this. Just kind of drawing out in our mind what makes us say yes or no. We would have, we would start at a state so we initially, so this arrow means here's where we start. So that's kind of like a computer program that has a main function that tells you where to start. We're starting here. And if we read an A, we go to a state that means we've read one A. So if we read an A, we go to a state meaning we've read an A. Now we expect to read another A. This is a state that means we've read two A's. So if we start off right here and we read a B, it's no good. Right away, it's no good, right? So we'll put a state down here. This means no good. If we ever end up here, that means we say no. So if we read nothing, we say no. If we read a B as the very first thing, we're going to come down here. And once we're here, this means there's no way we're ever going to say yes. So we'll say if we read an A or a B, we just stay here and then eventually answer no. Okay, so now if we read one A and we hit here, that's still unacceptable, so this is a no. But if we read a second A, it's still no good because we have to read at least one B. So this is still a no, but we're getting close to getting for it to be acceptable. If we read an A and then immediately read a B, that's no good. That'll definitely be a no. So this state, sometimes they call this a trap state, meaning once you get there, you never get out and you'll always answer no. So we've read an A, we've read another A, now we have to read at least one B. So if we read a B, we go to this state, which is still no good. But, and if, if we're over here and we read a third A, if we read an A and an A and a third A, that's no good. So a third A will put us here. Now, we read a B. We can now read as many Bs as we want. We just stay here. Nothing's changing. We're just reading Bs. And then eventually, we read an A. Then we're, then we're good. So I'll say yes here, 
And if after that A, if we read anything, either A or B, that's no good. No good. So that would go here. If we read an A or a B, we go back here. And do we cover everything? So every state, since our alphabet only has A's and B's, every state should have an arrow for either one. So we have, from this state we should have A and B, A and B, A, B. We can read as many B's as we want. A, we go here. B, we just keep reading them forever. And then if A takes us here, anything else we come here. Okay. So, this, we, we're going to call this a finite, finite state automata. That's a just, there's no memory. It's not like we're using any memory. We're just bouncing around from state to state as we read a uh, language, as we read a string. And just read it. Give, you could give this thing any string, and it'll just bounce around, and when the string is done, it's going to say yes or no. Right? So most of the, uh, most of the textbooks, instead of writing yes or no's in the boxes like I did here, what they tend to do is they use a double circle to mean yes. I think it's easier to say yes and no everywhere, but they use a double circle like this. And that means yes. And single circles mean no. For some reason, most textbooks do that. I think it's better to put a yes or no in the, in the circle. OK. So if a, language, if a language can be, if you can create a finite state automata that will always correctly answer yes or no, whether the string is in the language or not in the language, the language is said to be regular. So, regular languages which are depicted by regular expressions So, if you heard that, express, uh, that expression called a regular expression, like have you ever used on, on uh, Unix, have you ever used the grep command, G-R-E-P, yeah. to look for something? Yeah. So, G-R-E-P stands for, well, the R-E stands for regular expression. General regular expression parser, I think it's called. Is that what grep stands for? Oh, grep stands, for, okay, grep stands for something, and the R-E in the middle stands for regular expression. So basically what you're doing is, you could look for, you could say, like uh, in Unix, you could say, in this file, look for the following words. But you could also start saying, like, words that start with an M, star, X, like meaning it starts with an M and it ends in an X, and the stuff in the middle doesn't matter. And as long as it can, you know, reads an M, then reads a bunch of stuff, and then ends with an X, it'll answer yes or no. So that's really, that's what a regular expression is. This is a kind of. This is an application. I mean, grep is an application of this concept. Well, no, no. This, so this is this, so in, in theoretical, like in theoretical computer science. I guess I don't want to say the easiest, but what's pretty an easy class of languages. So in, in the end, what we're going to try to make the case is, all computer programs can be converted to a language where you answer yes or no for the language. So if there was a, a computation that, a, a program that outputted a number like 15, well that's kind of like saying all numbers with the exception of 15 get a no and 15 gets a yes. So how hard it is to write a program that will do that, th those two programs should be as equally as difficult as each other. And what we want to do is we want to see how much equipment do we need. And really the equipment's going to come down to states and then maybe some memory. We might have to use some memory to be able to say yes or no to a language. But if a language doesn't need any memory, it can just be followed by bouncing around from states and then eventually answer yes or no, then it's considered a regular language 
which is characterized. So L would be the regular language. This expression is called a regular expression, where you just start writing letters and then putting stars and brackets. And you know, you could say something like uh, A, B, 3, meaning it goes A, B, A, B, A, B, and then ends with an A. So this would be like A, B, A, B, A, B, A. And it's shorthand for it. So this is called a regular expression. And then using the grep tool, which somebody wrote for the Unix operating system, you can then search files. And you don't have to say the word exactly. You don't have to look for the word McDonald's in a file. You could say MC star S. And any word that starts with MC and ends with an S, it'll find. And it'll. So, and we could come up with a state machine that would say yes or no whether that's it in that, uh, in that set. Okay, so uh, regular languages are depicted by regular expression, regular language, and are, and are accepted, accepted, ACC. by finite state automatons. If you can draw a picture like this that will always correctly answer yes or no, then this, this is a regular expression. And if this is a regular expression, then there must be a picture like this. Each one means to do the other one. OK, so can all languages that anyone could ever dream up Will there always be a finite number of states, a state machine like this with a finite number of states? It could have a lot of states, but it's just as long as it's finite. Um, can you always depict every language like that? So the most famous language that you can't do that with is this one. Oh wait, so first, first let me go over uh, A to the I b to the j, where i and j are greater than 0. Can we come up with a finite automata for this one? And I'll call this language 3, please. Is it less than 0? What's that? Does it less than 0 or is it greater than 0? Oh, right, right. Good point. <laughs> so this means you we have at least one a, but it could B many. And then we have at least one a B. Oh, yeah, B. Okay. We have at least and I and J are two different numbers. So can we come up with a finite automata for this? This one would be pretty easy, right? I and J can tend to infinity infinity as well. Yeah. Um, they can go well, yeah, there's no cap on them, but eventually if someone gave you a word as input, what they're giving you is finite. They can't give you something that's infinite to put as input into your computer program. But yeah, so it could go as high as it wants. So we could start here. We could say if we have to read at least one A. Once we read an A, we can read many A's, as many as we want, and just stay there. Then we have to read at least one B. And then we could read as many B's as we want. And this is acceptable. And if, we, if the first thing we read is a B, that's no good. So this is our trap state, meaning once you come here, you stay here. And you'll always answer no. A or B, you just stay there. If we read an A, that's good, that's good followed by an A, so, yeah, so this is good. And then if we get to the point where we started to read Bs, if we read one more A, that's no good. So, it has, so really, it just has to start with A's and end with B's. And no, once it switches to B's, it can never switch back. That's what this language is. So, there's a line. This one, right? A. A. And then that would be no good if you read an A. All right, so that's a finite automata for this language. So that means this language is a regular, this is a regular language. This is a regular expression. And this is the finite automata that answers yes or no. Okay, what if we had, if these were the same? The number, so it has to start off with A's, 
end with B's, but the number of A's and the number of B's have to match. The last one, they didn't have to match. It could be any. Okay, now the only thing new is that they have to match. How can we do this? Hmm. We could do something like this. We start here. If we read 1A, then we must read 1B. And that is considered a yes. If we read 2As, then we must read two Bs. B and another B. And that's considered a yes. And we could be going forever with this, right? So in order to create a machine that could handle any input, the machine would have infinitely many states. So, and then what? If we read a B first, well, if we read nothing, that's no good. So we'd have some trap state. If we read a B, we'd go here. If a B, we, you know, there'd be a whole bunch of things that go wrong. Right? So, so the question now becomes, is there any way we could come up with a finite set of states that could always answer yes or no to this language? What made this language more difficult is we now require the number of A's and the number of B's to match. And now we have to start to realize we have to somehow, we need memory. This idea of having a, a machine that just bounces around from state to state and then when it's done it says yes or no is not enough. We need a piece of memory to, because we have to remember how many A's did we read. And then once we start reading B's, we have to say, okay, I just read a B, now let me check my memory. And, and you know, so we need a little more equipment. So we can use a stack. If we had a stack of memory, so we're allowed to write any letters from our language. Right, and our language is still just the letters A and B. A and B. We are allowed to write anything on the stack. And if you remember, uh, the way a stack ends up working is you have the ability to write. It's a pile of stuff. And you have the ability to write on what's considered the top of it. And once you write on the top of it, you move up to the next spot. And the only thing you're allowed to do with a stack is you're only allowed to look at the oh, top spot. Only from the top. Yeah, you can only put things on the top and you can only look at the top. You can't, if you're up here, like let's say we did, we put an A here and an A here and an A here and a B here and a B here, and we're right here. We can't say, hmm, let me see, what is this one again? You're not allowed to look there, right? So it's a, it's a piece of memory, but you're only allowed to look at what's on top. You can only push things on top of the top, and you're only allowed to see what's on top. You can kick what's on top off, but once you kick it off, you can't see it again. So it's a very limited theoretical piece of computer memory. But if we had a stack, if we had a stack, then could we come up with a finite automata where if you read a letter, you jump to a state and you could either add to the stack or pop, read from the stack. Or you're allowed to, each time you move from state to state, you're allowed to do one operation on the stack. So what we can do is every time we read an A, we push an A onto the stack. And then every time we read a B, we have to pop off a corresponding A. And then, so not only do we have to be in a yes state at the end, the stack also has to be empty. And if we ever pop a stack that's empty, meaning like there's nothing on the stack but my instructions say to get rid of something, then that means the la the, we answer no for that one. So the only way we answer yes is if we enter, if after we're done reading all the letters, if we are in a yes state and the stack is empty, then we answer yes. Otherwise we answer no. So we start off at a state and we read an A and we, we could write it, we could say here, push, push an A on the stack. 
and we have to read at least one A. Then here, so it's very small, push, an A. Every time we read an extra A, we push, uh, you know what, let me write it in the state, push an A. So every time we read an A, you get to the state and you push an A. Read another A, push another A. So if we read three A's, we're going to look like this. We're going to be at the top of the stack with three A's on it. Then if we read a B, we pop an A. And if there's no A there to pop, then we answer no. It's not, it's not part of the language. Every time we read a B, we come back here and we pop another A. And this is considered an acceptable state. This is a yes state. So if we read an A, if the very first thing we do is read a B, that's no good. We don't care about the stack. We're going to answer no. If we read an A followed by a B, we pop the stack, and if that's it, the stack is empty, we're going to answer yes. If we're out here, and we start reading more A's after we've read a B, that's no good. We're trying to count. So let's, so let's say, for example, the input was, so this is language three. So we're asking the question for language three, does A, 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 B, 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 is that a word? Should this answer yes or no? So it should answer yes, right? Yes. Right, so we start here, we read an A, and we push an A onto the stack. Then we read the next A, we push another A onto the stack. We read the third A, we push another A onto the stack. And now here's what we look like. We're in this state. And here's what our stat looks like. Now we read a B. So that says pop, pop an A off of the top of the stack. That means like the B that we just read, it's kind of like we're saying this B cancels this A. And then we read another B. So we pop another A off of the stack. And the stack's now that's the top of the stack. So this B canceled this A. This one canceled this one. And then we read another B, and we pop this A off, and now the stack is empty, and the word is finished. So if we are in a state with two circles, meaning yes, and the stack is empty, then we would answer yes. So if we, if we were doing this one, AAA with one B, this will answer no, and here's why. We'll go A. A, A, then we'll read a B, which will pop this off. Stack is not empty. Right, even though we're in a yes state, the stack is not empty, so we'll answer no. So the only way we answer yes is, are we in a yes state and the stack is empty? So if you could come up with, the, you know, this is, so this is kind of what a computer would be doing, right? Every computer program you'll ever write will go from state to state. We'll be bouncing around, you'll have every program you'll ever write will be moving around from state to state, but now we're using some memory to write some, write some results of computations we've done before. Okay. So these languages, these are not regular languages, ones where you need to use a stack as your piece of memory equipment are called, uh, these are called context languages are accepted by a, so a finite state machine with a stack together is uh, called a pushdown So if you have a language that you need to come up with a finite state machine plus a stack, 
in order to be able to say yes or no? That's a little more complicated than the regular expressions, right? Because we needed the stack. And the reason why, this is like the most simplest version of a language that needs a stack. Because I require the number of A's to equal the number of B's. Um, so a finite, autom a finite automator with a stack is called a push-down automata. So you keep pushing things down into the stack. Okay. So now, an even more complicated class um, would be, and this one took me a little while to believe this. I thought I could come up with a solution for this. Um, I thought I could come. I could, thought with a push-down automata, I'd be able to do this somehow. I'm going to use a. So I'm using a third symbol, the symbol C. So my alphabet is going to be A, B, and C. So we're reading a bunch of A's. Then we're reading a bunch of B's, but the number of B's has to match the number of A's. And then we read a bunch of C's, and the number of C's has to also. They all have to match. So, so, um, so I thought I could come up with a kind of a, you know, a, a thing that goes, you know, where I read a bunch of A's, and then, you know, at least one, and then I read a bunch of A's, and then I read a bunch, I'm going to read a bunch of B's, and then I'm going to read a, at least one C, and then a bunch more C's, and this is a double circle. And somehow I could use the stack to somehow keep count. There must be some way, like I'll, I'll put a, I don't know, I was trying to think of some way. There's kind of like, you think you can do it, right? Yeah. But eventually you convince yourself you can't. Because if you stack up the A's, then I thought maybe I could, uh, move from one, you know, you start thinking of things like maybe if, if I have two stacks, then I could be popping the A's off of one while building up another stack, right? So with two stacks, you can do it. You can kind of see you can do it with two stacks. And then you start thinking, is there some way I could use the two stacks and make them into one big stack? And, but eventually, you convince yourself, really, the only way to do it with a stack would be to have two stacks. But if you think about it, what is two stacks? If you had two stacks, and this is, so if you take a course in like computer science theory, not like foundations in computer science, but a, like a higher theoretical course, you start to realize if you had two stacks, what is that the same as? So in other words, like we could have done this. I could have said A, A, A. Now I start reading Bs. So each time I can pop an A off of here and also load a B here. So I could go like pop an A, add a B. Pop an A, add a B. Pop an A, add a B. And now I'm ready for the C's, right? But what is two stacks? Suppose we took the two stacks. Suppose we took these two stacks and glued them together this way. And I can write to this location. I can write to this location, like the bottom of the stack. I could also write to the middle locations. Um, I could also write, I could actually write anywhere I want. All I have to do is start popping up a one and pushing it onto the other one. Then I could really write anywhere, right? Uh, the, the, results must, the result must be the stack is empty. What is the result? What might be uh, for a push-down automata, this, the results would be... Do you have a class in here? Yeah. Okay, I'll be done with that. So, um, you could come in if you want to oh. and use the... Yeah. So, um, if... Uh, I'm sorry, what was your question? If what, is, what would be the output? Or what do you want to... Is it the well, okay, so the rules for a, for a push-down automata you would have to be, uh, the one and only stack has to be empty. Mm -hmm. If we allowed two stacks and made a rule they both have to be empty. Oh, that would be a problem. Well, no. No, the, 
two stacks have to be empty. Yeah, if, as long as they're both empty at the end, then we can say yes, that's an acceptable word. Yeah, we can even use the only one stack. Yeah. We can even push and pop, we can push and pop A, B, C. That would be empty, right? Why do we use two and pop? Well, I'm just saying, somehow when you're reading the B's, you're, you're popping off the A's. Mm -hmm. But you have to re still remember how many you had, because oh, once you get right. to the C. Yeah. But you, so you could see, you could do it if you had two stacks. Yeah. But theoretically, and this is like, yeah, when you start getting into these theoretical computer science classes, one of the big arguments is two stacks is equal to computer memory. Because basically, if you took two stacks and glued them together, and you could, then you can pop off of one side and pop onto the other, you could really just, if you ever wanted to read something down here, you could just pop everything onto this stack, read it, then pop it all back. So really, two stacks, it sounds strange, but two stacks is like all the computer memory you'll ever need in your life. So this problem ends up being a problem where you need more than a stack, you actually need to be able to see all the memory. So we could have done like, if we had one stack and we would go A, 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 and then just when we're reading the B's, just read through here, but don't pop them. And then with the C's, you could pop them. Then we could do it. So the problem is the limit of the stack is that you, the only way you can ever see your memory is you have to get rid of it, and then you won't be able to see it a second time. So, uh, okay. So these are, uh, so basically two stacks glued together is really like unlimited memory. And cl problems where you can use a finite state machine and random access memory, and now this is starting to turn into regular computer programs, those are called context sensitive languages. sensitive languages. And then, and these are called, uh, these are called recursive languages. They're also called recursive, and that translates into, in a, you could write a recursive computer program, a, pro, a routine that calls itself to solve the problem. And then, the fourth class, of problems is the problems where you can, um, by repeatedly running a recursive program, you would be able to print out every word in the language. And what this translates into is if you had a finite state machine with unlimited memory. So actually, in the real world, the computer actually has limited memory. However much memory is on the computer is how much memory you have. But theoretically, you have unlimited memory because your operating system could, if you needed to make more space, it could write the space out to a disk drive and then give you more free space. So theoretically, you have unlimited memory. And so an apparatus where you have a state machine plus unlimited memory but not unlimited time. Um, it's called, uh, that's languages that are called recursively enumerable. I guess about that way. Recursively enumerable, and they are accepted by. A Turing machine. And a Turing machine is—I don't know if you've heard of this guy Turing. He's uh, actually from New Jersey, <laughs> famous computer science person from like the 1930s. And the uh, the big award they give out once a year for computer program is called the Turing Award. I don't know if you've heard of that. That's like the you know the Academy Award for like the Oscars for movies, so the Turing Award is like the most famous one, but theoretically a Turing machine is basically a finite state machine that has unlimited memory and you could randomly access the memory. So in theoretical classes, um, if you take like a computer theory course, they'll start off with the regular languages, the context-free languages where you use a stack, 
than the context-sensitive languages where you have really two stacks that are glued together. So you have a finite amount of memory, a, a fi a, an amount of memory that is proportional to the size of your input. And then what's a theoretical machine, which really is a computer, is a Turing machine. That means you move around from state to state as your program's running and you have unlimited access to computer memory. And there are certain things that you can compute using that equipment. And there are certain things you can't compute. And anything you can compute using a Turing machine, you could solve on a computer. And anything you can't use solve with a Turing machine, you can't solve on a computer. So it's just this whole field is basically to theoretically figure out what's involved in doing a computation. So then we could then say, all right, it makes sense to use a computer to do that, or it doesn't make sense for, to use a computer to do that.